Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Craig Link. Uh, I'm uh, the uh, representing my boss, Congressman James Clyburn, here. Presumably I was invited because he wasn't available. Um, so thank you all for having me. Um, and happy to talk about a really great program that my boss has been very excited about for a long time now. Um, and we've been working on it for, for quite some time. It's the Rural Energy Savings Program and a uh, piece of legislation that Congressman Clyburn first, I think, formally introduced in 2010 um, after um, some back and forth with the uh, Department of Agriculture and the South Carolina Electric Co-ops, which we've got one member uh, uh, representative of here on the panel, and ultimately um, created this model, Rural Energy Savings Program, introduced in 2010, and as things go in Congress, not actually formally enacted into law until 2014 um, with the previous version of the Farm Bill. But it's in law now. It's been funded. That took another two years um, in 2016. And now the program is up and running, and we've got some great stories to tell about it. And, um, and so that's what we're going to get to today. So. Um, um, I'll go ahead and introduce our panelists, and then um, then we can get started. So first up, we've got um, Christopher McLean of the Rural Utility Service, the acting administrator, um, and um, nobody I think will be more uh, qualified to tell us about this program since it is your program and uh, you all administer it. But um, uh, Chris, why don't you uh, go ahead and um, uh, um, I'll let you give a few remarks about um, what RUS is doing with um, the Rural Energy Savings Program. Well, great. Thank you. I um, actually had a couple of slides here. We could uh, tee them up. So the United States Department of Agriculture is the home of the Rural Utility Service. The Rural Utility Service is the successor agency to the Rural Electrification Administration, and we are so happy and thrilled and comfortable to be right here at um, the cooperative businesses because uh, rural electric cooperatives are our primary customer in the RUS electric program. And so, uh, all right, we're, we're looking for the slides. And I'll start talking about uh, the RUS electric program. We, we lend uh, money to um, finance electric telecom, water, sewer infrastructure in rural areas. And uh, th oh, great, thank you very much. Uh, so the Rural Energy Savings Program is part of our electric program. Electric program lends about uh, four, we just, this year we just did just under $4 billion of either loans, small amount of grants to rural electric cooperative. And the Rural Energy Savings Program, RESP, um, is our newest program, and we are very, very excited about it. Uh, let me also introduce my colleague Bob Coates, who is a gentleman who has been in charge of running the RESP program for us. And uh, so here's how the RESP program, Rural Energy Savings Program, it is a relending program. So the Rural Utility Service, uh, my agency, Congress gives us appropriations. We will then make uh, take some of those funds and make a 0% uh, interest loan to an eligible borrower. An eligible borrower under the statute is typically a rural electric um, service provider um, or an uh, entity that is very much like that. So we will lend the money at 0% interest to the utility um, for 20 years or up to 20 years depending on what the business model looks like. Then the electric utility will then lend the money to the consumer for an energy efficiency measure. And the consumer can be a home, it could be a business, it could be a residence, it could be a university, it could be an educational institution, it could be a hospital, but it could be a customer of that utility. The consumer then pays back the utility through an on-bill financing mechanism. It can be any kind of uh, on-bill financing mechanism. It could be a tariff. Uh, where the utility sets a rate based on the energy efficiency investment and it goes with the meter on the house. It could be a typical you know, loan where 
I lend you money and you pay us back. Uh, you're capped at a 3% interest rate on the payback from the consumer, um, and that covers your administrative costs and your setup costs. Um, and then the consumer loan is for 10 years. You could also, there was a, the third way is PACE financing. If you're a municipal utility, you could also have an assessment on someone's um, property taxes. So the consumer pays back um, and at no more than 3%. Now their loan is for 10 years. The idea here is with 20 year financing for the borrower, they're going to be rolling over 10 year financing for the consumers. Then the utility pays RUS back um, for the, there's our arrow, we get paid back um, from the utility. And it's, uh, it's a wonderful um, positive uh, economic cycle because for the consumer, they, they're getting um, a much more comfortable house or a more efficient business. They're spending less money on their electric bills for the community. They're actually creating an uh, energy efficiency industry. And then for the utility, um, they're helping their customers uh, manage their future. And for rural electric cooperatives, it's absolutely perfect because rural electric cooperatives are not focused on producing profit. They're actually producing affordable power for their customers. And energy efficiency is a really key to that story. Now, how do you get involved in our program? Well, there's several steps. We try to make the first step really simple. Um, earlier uh, this year, uh, August 6th in 2018, we published a notice of funding availability. And we said, OK, uh, Rural America, we've got this program, Rural um, Energy Savings Program. We have what we'd expect to be about $100 million of financing available. And to get access to that, um, your applicant, which would be, again, typically your, your utility, they'll send us a letter. The letter of interest will say, uh, this is what we want to do. This is where we want to do it. This is how much we want to do, how, to, how we want, you know, how much we want to spend. And these are our financial um, credentials that we're going to be able to pay back the loan. And so we will then evaluate that letter of interest. It's, it's a narrative. It shouldn't be too difficult to be able to construct. And we'll screen that uh, letter of interest to make sure that it is eligible, to make sure that uh, it's in a, in a proper rural area. And then we will invite the applicant to submit a formal application. And they'll have 60 days to be able to put together a formal application for the money. I will say we're very generous on that 60 days. Anybody who wants to have more than 60 days, um, will, we're, we're, we're very kind and um, compassionate about that. Then we will review the application. Um, that's usually the, that's the trickiest part for us. I mean, everything we do um, in uh, federal lending, we have to make three basic findings. One project eligible, eligible. Two, is it financially feasible? Does it make sense on a business basis? Is there a way, are you gonna be charging more for, you know, you're charging less for your service and you're paying for your service, so you, you know, can you, can you make it work? Do you have a good management team in place? And then, can you provide reasonably adequate security for the loan? So because we're working with a utilities and utilities are the lender, they're usually able to be able to establish that. When it's an existing RUS borrower, we usually have a lien on all of their assets. That's a really quick economic judges, judgment for us. So we'll review the application, and then we will issue a commitment letter, which will then be signed by the borrower, the borrower, and then we'll document the loan, and we're off to the races. So who's been... Um, Approved for rep, rest financing. Again, it's, a, it's the newest program we have, but um, a very diverse group, some traditional customers uh, of rural electric cooperative family, but also some new types of um, entities. NOPEC, for example, is more of an aggregator um, of consumer benefits. Um, we've got, again, 
folks like Washita and PD, traditional rural electric cooperatives. We have um, Reliable Energy in Virginia. Of course, KW Savings is a coalition of cooperatives. So who can apply? You know, is anyone who's a current or former RUS borrower, any entity that's primarily owned or controlled by one or more of the above, and then any entity that is eligible to borrow from RUS, and then the statute references um, our regulation. So that's a quick overview of the Rural Energy Savings Program. We're very proud of it, um, and we are going to be, you're going to be hearing a lot more about it as we make the rounds over the next year um, talking about this great opportunity to help rural America. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, that's a great introduction, and I think, and let's keep this slide up here for a minute because our next two panelists are gonna speak about their experiences with both this program, but also, and I think importantly, both of these two co-ops, they already have programs in place that they have implemented with separate sources of fundings, uh, and you know, I'll let them flesh out exactly how they got started, to go ahead and get the ball rolling on putting in this model of loaning funds to their members, having their members' houses improved for energy efficiency, and having their members pay them back on their electric bill. And you guys can feel free to correct me if I'm getting that wrong. Um, but so let's first go to the um, general manager and CEO of Washita Electric Co-op, which as you see, they have been approved for RESP financing. Um, Mark Casey is the general manager and CEO of Washita Electric in Southern Arkansas. And uh, Mark, um, I'll turn it over. You want you to tell us a little bit about the program your co-op already runs and what you're gonna be able to do with it uh, once you get the um, financing from uh, Rural Energy Savings Program. Oh, thank you, and I've got a couple of slides. Um, of course, I'm Mark Casey. I'm with uh, Washita Electric Co-op. We're in far southern Arkansas. Uh, we started doing energy efficiency loans in 2014, I think, and, and they were just direct loans. And it was limited to insulation, air sealing, duct sealing. And actually, we were doing pretty good with that. We also went out to all of our schools and public buildings and uh, loaned them money uh, as far as uh, improving their lighting. Uh, and those were easy fixes that had very quick paybacks, but also had dramatic impact on the savings on their electric bills. Now, as we go forward, and uh, in 2016, we found out about a program called Pay As You Save. And in fact, our program previously had been called the HELP program, which was a home energy lending program. Uh, but we incorporated the Pay As You Save program, so now we call it HELP Pays. The difference is that it's a tariff, and it's not a loan. Um, so when we go to our individual members, and uh, Chris really teed this up nice for me here. If you'll see at the very top, the, the working capital, uh, which in this case is going to be coming from our REST loan, and that comes to the electric co-op. Um, we have a program operator. Our program operator's name is a company called Utility. Um, they find us contractors. All of our contractors must be certified by BPI or have a HERS rating uh, to do the evaluations of homes. Um, everything is done at an individual location. If the contractor goes out to do the work, our employees meet them out there, and we do a blower door test on each home, and we verify that the blower door test is accurate and done correctly, and then they go ahead and do the rest of the work, and they're adding insulation. And when we went to a tariff, and the difference in a tariff is that it's, it, it's, it's not a loan to the consumer. In fact, there's no credit check involved. Um, we're investing in the individual property. And we know that that property is gonna to have to be there for 10 years and that we can recover our investment in that property. And when we add insulation and we buy new heating and air conditioning, uh, the improvements that we make must pay for themselves. In fact, 80% uh, of the improvements must pay for themselves. 
uh, over the life of the program, and 20% goes immediately to the consumer. So if we were to go out to your house and we would install new heating and air conditioning, we would pay the contractor, we go out and inspect his work once they're completed, and then we calculate the amount. And now with REST funding, we've been charging 4.5% interest on the money that we had out. Now we'll be charging 0.5% interest to our consumers using the REST funding, and the REST money, and they will have 10 years to, to recoup uh, the improvements that are made. And so that we hope to even add uh, rooftop solar. In our area, a lot of it's backyard solar. <laughs> we have a little more room down there. <laughs> but, uh, um, but the improvements will pay for themselves. And the consumer gets 20% of those savings up front, from the, so their bill immediately goes down. Their homes are more comfortable. Um, as we've gone through the program, and the big advantage of going with the tariff, when we were loaning money, the people had to own their homes. And so a large percentage of our population was left out. So now we could do multifamily, we could do rental property. Even someone living in an apartment could call us and request, hey, can you come out and look at my apartment? And we would go out there and we'd see that they had a 20-year-old electric furnace. Uh, we replaced them with a new heat pump. We contact the landowner if it's okay to make sure that we can do these improvements. We've yet to have a, a, a landlord turn us down for <laughs> investing in his, in his property. And there, um, but prior to this, there's never been an incentive for landlords to make these improvements. The people renting the property um, are paying the utility bills, so the landlord it didn't have an incentive. The incentive for us, we, we want to lower everyone's bills. And I know that sounds strange coming from an electric company. But when we make efficient improvements, uh, we reduce our peak demand operating cost. And in fact, um, at the, the first number of loans, uh, investments that we made through the tariff after they had 12 months, these were, the, were averaging 22% annual savings on the electric bills. Many customers save more than 22%. A few save less. We actually had a couple go more too, and we investigated those to find out why. And kids moved back home, or parents moved back home, or they added on, or something. But the, the savings have been pretty dramatic. But when we put in that new heating and air conditioning, it lowers our peak demand cost, and we don't charge for any of these services. If we go out and do a home evaluation, there's no there's no fee, whether you go through with the work or not. And uh, it's just to educate people about their homes. And we will start using rest money to lower that cost to 0.5%. And because of the lower interest rate, we want to be able to offer home solar. Uh, to, if you do the energy efficiency improvements, the solar is going to work that much better. And it also will help meet the requirements by the state of Arkansas so that we can avoid net metering. Uh, so we'll help size the solar facilities so that they use what they need, but if we tighten up the house, have high efficient air conditioning, our peak load goes down. Our peak load will go down even more with solar because we are a summer peaking utility, and solar works best in the summertime. So uh, we'll have that opportunity as well. So that's a brief description of our program, and I appreciate the Perfect. opportunity to be here. So. All right, and then um, introduce our third panelist, um, Rob Artis, is president and CEO of Santee Electric Cooperative, which uh, serves four counties in the 6th Congressional District of South Carolina, uh, Clarendon, Florence, Georgetown, and Williamsburg counties. You probably don't get introduced like that a lot, but uh, that's how we'll do it today. Um, so um, at Santee, they are part of what has been a sort of multi-co-op effort um, among several South Carolina co-ops um, and their program. Uh, um, and, and Rob, you'll, you can tell me sort of about how it originates, but is the, the Help My House program. And so this is sort of how my boss, Mr. Clyburn, got involved with Rural Energy Savings Program. Um, South Carolina Electric Co-ops had sort of developed this Help My House program and we're trying to figure out we know there is a way 
to really invest in energy efficiency, but we've got to figure out the mechanisms and a, a, as part of that, and then got to figure out the financing. And then the, we, they brought to us and, and to my boss this idea of let's create a program that would put the financing in place. And so that's what we've been trying to do with Rural Energy Savings. Uh, but Rob, tell us about what uh, you guys are working on at Santee and um, what the group of co-ops in South Carolina uh, hopes to, to do with the, with the new funding. We'll do, and thank you, Craig. Uh, I think you saw on the list earlier uh, the, a group called KW Savings, and that is a group of co-ops from South Carolina that, um, that, that has gotten involved in this. Uh, the original South Carolina pilot project was in 2011. Um, that was made possible by a change in the South Carolina law that allowed on-bill financing in 2010. So that was, that was critical because before the General Assembly allowed us to do that, in 2010, we would not have had the ability to do on-bill financing, which is what makes this program so good. Um, but anyway, in 2011, there was a small pilot project. Um, some of the co-ops involved in the pilot project did not go forward with it. But then again, some of the ones who watched the pilot project from outside decided that they did want to get involved in the big program when we started Help My House. And so we have uh, a half a dozen or so co-ops in South Carolina that are very involved in a program called Help My House. We started full speed in 2013. Um, to date, Santee Electric is somewhere around 250 homes. To give you a relative scope, uh, like Craig said, Santee Electric serves four counties in South Carolina. We're located roughly between Charleston and Myrtle Beach if you need a couple of landmarks. Um, but it's an exceptionally rural area. We have about 44,000 active accounts. Um, and, and our real driver behind this program was we just got tired of telling our members, I'm sorry. Um, mm. the, the truth is a lot of times folks would call in and say, why is my power bill so high? And of course, we've got energy experts and we would send them out to the homes. And a lot of times we would tell them the reason your power bill is so high is because your, your doors and your windows and your HVAC system are just allowing a tremendous amount of cold air in the wintertime and, and hot air in the summertime into your house. And in order to, to fix this, this isn't a simple thing of switching your light bulbs out. You need to do $10,000 worth of repairs on your home in order to lower your power bill. Well, most of the time when people would hear that story, they would say, yeah, that's impossible. I, I, there's no way I can afford $10,000 worth of repairs. I guess I'm stuck with this high, high light bill. And like I said, we were tired of telling people, you know, I'm sorry. Until you get these things fixed, you're going to continue to use this much electricity. So when this opportunity came around, we realized that this was maybe an opportunity finally for us to put something in front of our members that they could actually tackle. Because if you think about it, the only other option, I don't think that it was going to be very easy to go to your average bank and say, I need to borrow $10,000 and I'll pay that back based on the money I save on my power bill. That's exactly what we do with our program though. Uh, that, that's, that's exactly what we have and uh, it has been a, a tremendous, uh, tremendous success for us. Now, initially we were funding this program with red leg loans, Rural Economic Development Loan and Grant, I think, uh, if I'm yep. getting all the uh, Perfect. <laughs> acronyms right. Um, so, so a lot of the co-ops went through that process. Uh, traditionally, we have charged a 4% interest rate on that because we have to cover our administrative costs. There is a good bit of money associated with going out and doing the inspections and, and uh, staying on top of the loans and making sure that uh, we're, we're picking the right, um, the right cases. I mean, you don't, you don't just want to do $10,000 worth of repairs on a home to fix duct work and, and adding, uh, putting a new HVAC system in when there's holes in the roof for the floors. And we've seen that. Um, there are certain homes out there that are just not cut out for this project just by itself. Sometimes we have to team up with uh, other local agencies and say, you know, we can work on the energy efficiency part of it. We can work on the HVAC system. We can work on the duct work. We can do the blower door test, but somebody else has got to put, give this person a new roof because it doesn't matter if you've got a brand new HVAC system. If all of the cold air or all of the hot air is coming in through a hole in the roof, it's just not going to happen. Um, but it, it's been a very success, successful uh, situation for us. We're very excited about the RESP program. Um, 
And I think of the total money that's been allocated. Uh, South Carolina has, has been able to speak for about $13 million of that. And Santee Electric, my co-op, uh, has about $2.5 million coming to us. We anticipate that, that that's enough money to allow us to do five years worth of these, uh, worth of these loans. So that would be a, a tremendous help for, uh, for some of the members in our community. Um, and like I said, of course, we'll, we'll change our interest rate to, to 3% now. But, uh, but still, I think everybody, the great thing, one great statistic I want to throw out there is since we've started this, uh, with the exception of one house fire, which was, not a, was, which was not an electrical house fire, by the way, with the exception of one house fire, we have had no defaults on these loans. So uh, that, that's been a tremendous thing for us. Um, it's a great opportunity. Um, I think that our folks, especially in our marketing department, don't mind getting that call anymore because they know they don't have to say, I'm sorry anymore. They can say, we do have something for you. Now, we have not explored the tariff option yet, which is a great idea. I, I like that because we are currently limited. You know, we have a lot of heirs property in South Carolina where I own, mm. I own this home, but so does my brother and my sister and a couple of aunts and uncles. We can't do a loan in a situation like that. If they don't own this home, we can't do anything in a situation like that. And also, there's some limitations on the age of the manufactured housing. Uh, so we may very well, you know, I know y'all are here to learn something about this. I, I'm definitely going to pursue this tariff option because uh, if, we can ex if we can open this up to folks who don't necessarily own their own home outright or renters, this is something that would be uh, exceptional for us. I'll leave you with one more statistic before I turn it back over to Craig. A lot of folks like to talk about thousand dollar, a uh, thousand kilowatt hour light bills. That's the that's the industry standard. We talk about thousand kilowatt hours. The average South Carolinian uses twelve hundred kilowatt hours. Now that's because we have a tremendous amount of heat pumps in our state. The average Santee Electric consumer, thirteen hundred and sixty four kilowatt hours in an average month. That is significant. That, that's, uh, that's significant when you're considering how you know when most people are considering a thousand kilowatt hour light bill. Um, that is because of the standard of the housing in South Carolina, and also because we are predominantly uh, our members are predominantly using heat pumps and electric resistance heat strips in the winter time, and that's what that's what really hurts them. And so the more we can do to upgrade their HVAC systems, the more we can do to make their homes energy efficient. Uh, it makes a huge deal for us, and I would argue with that with that average of 1364, it makes probably makes a bigger deal for our consumers than the average in in the state and the in the nation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, so and Rob, quick follow up question on that. T tell us, just give us one example of a Help My House customer, what they were paying originally, what work you did, and what you got them down to. Uh, if you know any off the top of your head. I do. Uh, okay. we, we've been very fortunate. Congressman Clyburn has actually come to two of our homes. Um, <laughs> one of them in, in particular was uh, Miss Martha Scott in, uh, in Trio, South Carolina. Our average uh, member has been saving about 30% on their light bill after one of these programs. Typically what we do to one of these homes, and this is what we did for Miss Scott, is uh, we'll, we'll rework the duct work. Uh, I think she got a brand new HVAC system, uh, added insulation in the attic, uh, insulation around the, the, the duct work, the windows and doors. Um, Miss Martha Scott, I think, was 90 years old. She, she's blind. Um, she has a couple of uh, sons that live uh, near her and help take care of her. Um, she was exceptionally proud of the fact that she could come home and live in her family home, and she was delighted for an opportunity to show her home to Congressman Clyburn. I think that was the, <laughs> the highlight of her life, to be able to walk uh, Congressman Clyburn through her, her what, what she considered her new home, because the amount of uh, repairs that were made to her home really made her feel like she had a new home. And it's not just about saving money. Her quality of life is significantly better now because of this program. Um, the comfort level in her home is significantly better because of that. Uh, he, he, he came out to another one uh, most recently, but I don't think any of us will forget Martha Scott because, uh, because of her story. It was just a fascinating story. It was very touching, and it, it was a highlight for her to, to get to see your boss out there. <laughs> and so even though she's paying back the loan now on her bill, She's saving money right now. The, the goal is that 
and, and in her case and in most of the cases the bill is about the same it's just that the uh, I'm sorry the, the overall invoice that they pay is about the same because there's a portion now that's paying for these improvements but in 10 years when the loan goes away then she's going to be saving money so the idea is that we take the gap that 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 they were able to save because of the energy efficiency and and cover the loan and so if we're not saying that you're going to get a brand new house and and everything's going to be a whole lot more comfortable and your light bill is going to go down the truth is whatever amount your energy portion of your light bill goes down we're typically making that up to pay for the loan so her she's not seeing a huge reduction in her light bill to start with but her quality of life is better immediately and then when the loan gets paid off then her light bill does come down um and mark shift over to you piggyback on some of your your comments if I heard you right, you've got a percentage split that you're trying to hit with every house in terms of savings and payback, uh, 80%, is that right? The guideline of our program says that 80% of the savings allows us to recover our investment. And so that 20% of the savings go to the homeowner or, or resident immediately. So e even the very first month, and because we have smart meters, and we can see daily usage when we go out in the summertime and it's a hot day and you've done these improvements you can look in our portal and that customer can see the very next day uh, that their usage has dropped because we, we try to encourage them to look at their usage and break it down into daily basis and if they're they're sitting there using uh, 10 or 12 dollars a day and if you add that up over 30 days you know, it's going to be a pretty significant bill and, and so when they can put it in daily terms and they try to drop that to eight dollars a day or six dollars a day uh, significant reduction in their electric bills that they get immediate feedback on too and so in that case though they'll get two savings meaning you get some a little bit on day one but then after a period of years like you're saying you save even more that's correct so the other thing i heard you say this impacted co-op costs for your whole co-op meaning are you saying that it actually saves other people money or saves your co-op money as we reduce our peak load our cost of power goes down and so that that helps every member of the co-op so e even if you lower your bill you're helping the other members have lower power cost and it helps us avoid going for rate increases it helps us uh, manage our cost and a lot of people are amazed that we can uh, that, that, that your bill can go down and uh, we're still able to maintain our financial metrics that, that make it possible for us to, to stay in business and manage the load that we have so that we can also serve new customers which is our really our goal we're in a part of the world where we've not seen a lot of growth but that we're hoping that improving homes and improving neighborhoods can also stimulate economic development on that I was looking at um, right before I came here so your service territory in southern Arkansas, very rural, I'd compare it in economically probably to uh, your service territory in South Carolina. Both of these areas are some of the poorest, m most persistently poor communities really in America, I think, it, it, by any metric. You know, um, um, you, I think you both represent what are classified as persistent poverty counties these counties that have been over poverty for 20 uh over 20 percent of poverty for 30 years or more um have you seen economic development impacts um because of the investment obviously you're borrowing money from the rural utility service and pumping that into the community what what type of uh results have you seen or do you expect with more investment uh do, do you see any any effects there <laughs> we're seeing quite a bit because we require a minimum of a 16 sear hvac system uh, we use all of our local contractors so all the money that that we invest gets spent in our local economy and go into local contractors that do the labor uh, our own employees do inspections uh, we have local auditors that are contract auditors as well so that part is is uh, d definitely proving some results and adding a few jobs uh, as we continue to do this though and we're also involved in a fiber to the home project of bringing fiber to rural 
and uh, we can we can thank RUS for that as well that they're funding mm -hmm. us being able to take uh, fiber out and in our area we have only five meters per mile of line on average and we, we're replacing people that are on dial-up and they're going they now have one gig fiber available and we also started including nest thermostats with all of our home improvements and as we extend fiber and we want to connect them we need smart meters uh, to help our meter system work, but it also helps them take better control. And we're starting to see uh, that our property values are going up. People will now look at homes in our area. If they wanted to work from home, they could, they could not live in our area. And uh, knowing, number one, that the, the home is improved and more energy efficient, and now we've been able to include fiber with it, it just becomes a much more appealing area for people to move to. Sure. Yeah, I mean, actually, some some direct economic uh, improvements. Uh, this this program has actually added a position at Santee Electric and also at our statewide level. So there, there's an employee at Santee Electric who is there, um, you know, specifically for this program, and it, it's paid for by this program. Same way with the KW Savings Group. There's an employee at our statewide level who's there specifically for this. But but that's that's just two jobs. Um, like, like my colleague here was saying, the majority of what we see is that, you know, we are using a tremendous amount of local contractors. The truth is, just because we're so far away from metropolitan areas, you're not going to get someone from Columbia or Charleston or Myrtle Beach to come into Trio, South Carolina, to do this kind of work. You have to use local contractors. And so the good thing about that is, is that's adding jobs for them. And so they're, they're seeing that on a regular basis. And, uh, and, and we're pretty excited about it. And, um, but again, it's hard to put a it's hard to put a dollar amount on quality of life. But that that's that's something that's just it makes people more proud of their homes. It's ma it makes people more comfortable with where they live. Uh, it, it just makes their their lives better because of this. Um, Chris, let's go back to you for a minute. Um, I don't want you to feel left out. Um, <laughs> so, obviously, we started working on rest back in 2010 yeah. and we're just now you know being able to really roll out the, the the funding which is great in the interim rus has done some other programs similar um mm -hmm. i'm familiar with the energy efficiency mm -hmm. and conservation loan program yeah. um what were your experiences with that and how does resp compare and you know uh, um, um are there differences there sure and and um you know which ones are sort of better suited for for some of these communities yeah, you bet good good question and energy efficiency has been part of the rural electric cooperative story really ever since the very beginning uh, again cooperatives as customer-owned enterprises are focused on the customer needs so we've had um in many years of our program, a, a loan deferral um, program for direct lending where if you wanted to set up a conservation system, you could say, well, give us some relief for a few months to pay and we'll tack that on to the end of the loan. So we've had that um, over a number of years. That's where a lot of co-ops got started in some energy efficiency activities. Energy efficiency conservation loan program is, is a similar in structure to RESP but not as attractive in its interest rate. And you might use the eClip uh, program if you want to do systemic um, types of uh, uh, energy efficiency investments. But uh, the congressman put his finger on it when he found that magic formula in RESP. That 0% interest rate, that structure very similar to the Red Leg program, and the empowerment of the consumer because the other part of this equation is those once you make that investment in that home it's more valuable so your customer is wealthier so you're adding to the wealth of the community and the individuals as well as saving them uh, money and I'm glad you mentioned about uh, manufactured homes that are just impossible to retrofit this March Congress gave us authority to say that we could do a whole home replacement with a new manufactured home that's energy efficiency to replace an old manufactured home. Now we're not, you know, we're, we're curious about how the economics of that gonna are going to work, um, but I think, you know, if you put some 
different pieces together, maybe some charitable organizations, uh, the Rural Electric Cooperative, you could dramatically change quality of life because there are so many substandard manufactured homes in rural America that are absolutely impossible to retrofit and extraordinarily expensive to heat and cool. So um, I think it's a really an interesting opportunity as we look forward. The other thing we mentioned um, before we got started here, Michael Henderson from Arkansas uh, Electric um, Cooperative Organization, he is a uh, very forward thinking on transportation segment. And I think that's another area where looking forward, you could see the electrification of transportation as an opportunity because what Congressman Clyburn's legislation did, it didn't mandate electric efficiency, it mandated energy efficiency. So that allows us as a traditional electric financer to look broadly on energy efficiency. So then you can see opportunities for utilities to, on one hand, grow their load by providing more energy efficiency through electrifying new parts of uh, the economy. So it's a pretty exciting, forward-looking um, opportunity for, for co-ops as, as well as all utilities serving rural America. Can I ask a question? Sure. Take it? Sure. To participate? So the statute, the statute speaks that the consumer pays back on their electric bill. So that could be a loan, it could be a tariff, or if you're a municipal utility, it could be um, a um, assessment on your property tax. So there's, you know, in terms of RUS, that is a statutory element that the repayment come somehow through the electric bill, um, but we're agnostic about what that technique is. So it really, the, the, in order to participate, this really has to be, if you were a non-electric co-op, which um, I am in New Hampshire, in New England, mm -hmm. um, but some of the issues that you're talking about in terms of energy efficiency, there are a lot of mobile homes and actually in our state, yeah. Uh, the largest contingency of cooperatives are mobile home cooperatives. Um, but many of them uh, can't run on electricity because, uh, as probably some of you may know, the New England electric grid is just uh, vastly insufficient. And um, so you've got you know other flexible fuels like heating oil and propane mm -hmm. and pellets and biomass and integrating with solar. So I, my understanding is, is that those types of fuels would not be able to participate in this type of a program? So the fuels are not that important. I mean, you have to demonstrate that there is an energy savings and, and a, a cost savings to the consumer. So that, that's part of it. Now, what may be an issue is that not being an electric utility, you might want to partner up with an electric utility. Um, and that's a, that's we're seeing we're seeing examples of that, and um, uh, where you know maybe a, a, a housing cooperative could partner with the electric utility. Again, the the thing that makes this program so powerful is that the credit risk is at the utility level, because they're the ones that can they have the assets they can afford to borrow the money. Um, and at zero percent, why not, right? Um, then the utility can put the uh, dollars to use, perhaps in partnership with um, a housing cooperative. I mean, that, that, that's one model that might work. I haven't, uh, among that list, I haven't seen that yet, but we're just getting started, and, and we want to be um, innovative yeah, and, and encourage partnership. From the New England market. Yeah, we've. Yeah. Yeah, and we've we've um, we've talked to people with New England. We uh, in, in uh, we've 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 we had extensive discussions with in Vermont, um, and, and and have worked with them, and would welcome um, welcome any applications from from New England. Definitely. Question back here.
so I think you were saying you could use like two and a half million over five years. That's right. And that would help you do like how many homes or what percent of your our our average loan is about ten thousand dollars. So that that'll kind of give you an idea of how uh, you know how far that get that gets spread. Now, if we were talking about replacing whole homes, yeah, and that's some big money. <laughs> well, no, not necessarily. I mean, I can I can envision a case where twenty thousand dollars worth of repairs on a really old substandard house would not get you very far, but you could get yeah. a real. A, basically a new manufactured home as long as it doesn't have all the bells and whistles. So, I mean, you're not getting that far. You don't have to stretch it that much to be able to replace the whole home. And sometimes that's probably the better case. $20,000 would be better spent on that. But, but to answer your question, ours is about $10,000 a piece. That's an average. Okay. And so the $100 million that's available, is that per year? That's, that's what I have available right now. Well, it's, I have it avail I have it until it runs out, um, or we hit the end of the fiscal year. So, and then I'll piggyback on that. This program has gotten funding in the last three appropriation cycles. It has to be funded every year because it's part of the annual discretionary budget. Um, there as, is as is our core program. Yeah, I mean we've been we've been funding on an annual basis for eighty plus years of electrification. We just in, we just started the FY nineteen fiscal year, but the Department of Agriculture doesn't have its bill done yet. <laughs> but once it does, I expect uh, there'll be more funding again. And so, depending on how the appropriations go in Congress, will dictate your funding level. That's right. right. Yeah. So right now, I've got plenty of funds to go around. Um, We're looking at home solar today. Um, I think within a year or so, we will be looking at storage as well. My understanding is that, that storage is eligible. Sure. I and, uh, just got to demonstrate that it is efficient and cost savings, right? There's the, those two pieces. You have to, so there's, it's a mathematical thing. You have to be able to demonstrate that the energy you're replacing is less efficient than the energy you're using and uh, that it is beneficial to the customer. So, so renewable energy, distributed generation, storage, smart grid, behind the meter investments in um, smart home technology, it's all, you know, trans, you know, transportation charging stations, they're all up for grabs. Um, and it's, a, it's very locally based. It's what the community wants. As we see, some, uh, some of our borrowers are focusing on HVAC, some are focusing on insulation, some are focusing, uh, you know, on a whole combination of, of Im improvements. And again, with this new authority, I think there is going to be some interest in um, whole home replacement. And, and uh, for us, the challenge is to, to figure out how in that 10-year time frame you can pay back um, uh, an investment of that size. But perhaps with new partnerships of, again, the utility with the housing co-op or with a charitable organization that can help bring down the, the total financeable part uh, I think it's, it's a pretty powerful um, combination, but we're wide open. Uh, I think the other thing that is so fascinating right now is in the electric industry smart grid, the connecting of all of the infrastructure of the electric utility in order to improve communication, security, and control costs is taking off like crazy. And we're even seeing smart grid fiber-based all the way to the home. Um, and that's a real powerful combination that leverages both energy efficiency and the demand for broadband in rural communities. And they're synergistic investments with each other. So you're able to validate your 
energy efficiency investments because you've got smart grid technologies. The smart grid technologies allow you to do systemic energy efficiency because really when it comes to electric utility, the volume of kilowatts is not almost as important as the time as when you use it. Uh, we, there's one co-op in Texas that has four days of the year and one hour of each of those days. So four hours of the year set their rates for transmission in the coming year. So if they could shape their load, and usually without the customer even knowing about it, they can just control the cost on those peak days, they can save their customers money in the next year, and then really save their customers money by not having to go to the market on those hottest days or the coldest days when um, energy costs are so expensive. And again, that it's also so, and it comes all together in the cooperative model because the motivation is to serve your member owners, not so much as your shareholders to generate as much profit as possible. Any other questions? Okay. And I think that puts us right at 1030, right? Or, a little longer. All right. Well, um, let's see here. Um, well, as we finish up here, um, you talked about this new eligibility. Um, yep. You had a list up of the amount of rest balloons that you currently uh, yep. that we currently have out and so we've got obviously two examples here what what's the working total of uh, uh, i think bob we're at like 40 some million but that's money that congress has previously appropriated mm -hmm. so the notice we published in august is for another so there's a new round so of there's 100 a new million round available. of a, there's a new round of 100 and even those that some of those folks that were in the queue from mm -hmm. the previous funding, um, we get to carry some of that over. And some of them were in the queue waiting for a signal for Congress, which we got, because um, we, we did have a couple that were um, related to home improvements and mm -hmm. we needed some uh, clarification before we could proceed. So, so um, Again, nobody should worry about running out of money yet. That would be a good problem to sure. have. And I'm, I'm sure uh, you're, you're, Congressman Clyburn would be the first one to hear about it if we did run out of money. Um, you know, and, and what, what my colleagues here on, on the panel have embraced is a fundamental transformation of their business model, right? And, and what I see in electricity is very much what we saw um, over the last couple of decades in telecommunications. So it wasn't that long ago when, you know, when was the last time you worried about a long distance call or the number of minutes on a cell phone, right? We went from selling minutes in telecommunications and long distance or local to just selling lifestyle and communications. And so electric is doing something very, very similar. We're, we're kind of shifting from focusing on selling kilowatts, but to selling to lifestyle and comfort and managing all of the energy needs in your life. And it's, it's, it's a big change. And some of the states are adopting to that with the um, on-bill financing um, mechanisms and the way that rates are structured. Incorporate the electric industry is changing from a one-way system where we just push power out to the consumer to uh, all kinds of uh, renewable sources, energy being generated by customers, put back on the grid. Storage is now coming in. So that all this new technology, all this change and two-way uh, directions of both power and communications um, are part of the modern electric infrastructure. So being able to control your total cost, your total consumption as a utility and as a consumer today is more important as, as ever, but now more possible than ever because of this, this massive technology change we're going through. Now, can um, co-ops and others who get uh, rest loans, can you reapply? Oh, yeah. In fact, 
we're starting to get some return customers. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. Mark, yes. Rob, you guys, uh, you guys want to start talking here? You, are you, <laughs> and it's you, a lot easier. It's a lot easier coming back. So, right. so membership has its privileges, mm -hmm. right? Um, the hardest part, like when so KW Savings is a coalition of co-ops, and we've 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 gone back and forth and trying to figure out how to do the security arrangements and um, our our uh, general counsel and KW. But we we now that we've got the magic formula. The next KW savings, maybe in North Carolina or in Ohio, they'll say, oh, that's a KW model, and then boom, we're ready to go. So that ramp up, that, those, that first you know, group of pioneers in this program have really done a great service to the rest of the country because they've helped us figure out the business model working together, helped us figure out the security arrangements so that the loans can get repaid. And so now that we're ready to, you know, step it up big time, um, we, we're, we're, we've got those uh, models ready to go. That's great. Well, on that, I'm hearing we're out of time. Or no, no, actually, I just have one more oh, we got a question. 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 Never mind. Really, really. Uh, so, so just building on what Chris said, I mean, Rob and Mark, what you're doing is not business as usual, right? You're, you're doing something mm -hmm. very different. A lot of rural electric co-ops are reluctant to go there. What's, what's the case you make to your fellow co-ops about why you should be doing what you're doing? Well, and one of the points I wanted to get in, and one of the things that helped my board have confidence that we could uh, do this for our members, uh, the state of Arkansas created a loss reserve fund. And they put up $100,000 for us in case we had to default. We've had no defaults. Uh, but that money is there, it's not been used, and I really want to put out props to the North Carolina Sustainability Fund. They called me up one day and they said, we'd like to add another $50,000 to your loan loss reserve fund. And I said, <laughs> really? <laughs> and, uh, and so our, our loss reserve has been increased to $150,000. They're telling me if we add home solar to our portfolio, they will increase that again. And that is from uh, the North Carolina Sustainability Fund, which was, uh, they just called me one day and said, we want to send this money to you. And, and it's sitting in a fund, it, we've never had to draw on it, but it's, it's there, but, it, but that reserve fund gave my board confidence that if we did have a problem, um, it could be overcome. But uh, we're, we're four years in, it's not a problem. Right. The way the way we make this case, in addition to the uh, you know the the bleeding heart story that I led off with, is if, if you look at my income statement, um, seventy percent of my expenses are my wholesale power bill. So if I don't have to sell them those kilowatt hours, I don't have to buy those kilowatt mm -hmm. hours either. So it's it's not. I know a lot of people say, well, we only sell kilowatt hours, and we certainly don't want to sell less of them. Um, I mean, that is true. We, we only sell one thing. Um, but, but the truth is, every time, uh, every time we're able to help somebody save 100 kilowatt hours, uh, you know, I've, I've saved myself 100 kilowatt hours that I didn't have to buy. So it's, it's, not, all, it's not all profit, and it's not going to drive the cooperatives into, uh, into bankruptcy. Um, we, we were created for the membership. We're not there for, to make a profit. Um, we still want to be strong financially, but I mean the truth is um, we can we can help them save and the critical point uh, is if we can help them save during the right times of the day. I think right. this lady brought up uh, storage. I mean that that is crucial. If we can do this at a certain time of the day, not every kilowatt hour is worth the same. Mm -hmm. I believe that before I retire, we'll see banks of batteries in our substations. I'll be I'll be storing power in the middle of the night and using it during the day's peak. Um, I, I think that's uh, that's the key there. We want to help them use less electricity, but we want to help them use ele less electricity at the times when electricity is most expensive. Yeah, and in some states, energy efficiency has um, has value, monetizable value. In the Northeast, in particular, we have the forward markets, so you can have utilities actually selling savings and deriving value out of that. That's or funny.
cost something, but the savings yeah. that could be passed along are enormous. Yeah. And that could actually go into a fund for uh, rescue recovery um, during natural disasters. You know, like they could put that savings for the rainy day when we have hurricanes and what have you. you know? And then you have other states that have renewable portfolio standards so that you actually have utilities just anxious to get and um, you know renewable assets and then you've got corporations that want to have zero carbon footprint so they're out in the market looking for green credits so you know maybe the challenges for the housing cooperative is to see some of these non-cash monetary assets and get them into the mix to be able to make um, an energy efficiency play maybe on a whole home replacement financially feasible. Mechanism instead of being on the electric bill, because if because we could we could have a lot more inroads in New England very quickly if we if that wasn't a requirement. So that's just my two cents. <laughs> so when you amend what, the bill, what, take it under advisement. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that back. Um, Okay. Uh, well, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for coming, panelists. Great. Very much. Thank you. Appreciate y'all having us. And then, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.